good evening. If you didn't know this, I just know this. Pat, or Brother Gerber told me that it's a countdown right there, by the way. So on that scramble board. So page 525, let's stand. We're going to sing uh, this song. You may have never heard it before, but uh, it's a good song. Page 525, I will praise him. Page 525, as we stand. When I saw the cleansing fountain, open wide for all my sin, I obeyed the Spirit's wooing when he said, Wilt thou be clean? I will praise him, I will praise him, praise the Lamb for sinners slain. Give him glory, all ye people, for his blood can wash away each day. Verse 4, page 525, glory, glory. Glory, glory to the Father. Glory, glory to the Son. Glory, glory to the Spirit. Glory to the three. Would remain standing for opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for the uh, members that are here today. Lord, just be with each one of us and Lord, open our hearts to hear the message tonight. Lord, be with the pastor, give him the power of the Holy Spirit and the words to uh, speak unto us, Lord, from, from you, Lord, that we can apply your message to us, Lord, and uh, Lord, just help us. Um, to serve you and honor you in everything that Cornerstone Baptist Church does. We thank you and praise you in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. We would remain standing for the next song, page 524. This will be a time of handshaking, get, get to greet each other around the auditorium. This evening, page 524, we'll sing that first verse there. It took a miracle. My father is omnipotent. And that you can't deny a God of might and miracles, tis written in the sky. It took a miracle to put the stars in place. It took a Show the handshake and see.
page 524, we'll sing that last verse, The Bible Tells Us. The Bible tells us of His power and wisdom all way through, and every little bird and flower are testimonies to. It took a miracle to put the star. song beautiful singing you can be seated all right well good evening and welcome to cornerstone baptist church we're so happy to see you here tonight and uh just got a lot going on and so make sure you make plans to join us for all the activities and things going on uh men uh september 13th and 14th we're going to be going to hoosier hills baptist camp and there's going to be a lot of great things to do the sign up sheets in the lobby so make sure you sign up and there's still plenty of time to do so and we're going to have a, a great time together it was wonderful last year and we'll hear great preaching, have good food, good fellowship. It will be great. And so uh, make sure you sign up for that. And then um, wanted to let you know we're going to be having a church budget meeting uh, September 1st when we're going to discuss how we're going to use the 1750 uh, from the mortgage. And it was a cool day today because the mortgage company said we're going to be sending you the actual paid off statement in mortgage that says zero in the mail. And so that's going to be awesome. Can't wait to burn that. And so we're going to have to discuss as a church uh, what the deacons and I propose to use that money, the 1750, and how it connects with our budget. And so make plans to be there Sunday night, September 1st, and we'll go over our plans for that uh, former mortgage money. Um, also, uh, we're going to have a guest speaker, R.B. Ulett, is going to be preaching uh, Sunday, um, the 25th of August, and so it'll be great. So. Uh, make sure you be there for that. It's going to be a blessing. And then the seniors from our school are going to be having a bake sale on August 28th. They'll be having it during the day of school. And then they'll be selling stuff before church and then after church. And so if you get here a few minutes early, uh, go down to where they're set up in the, in the gymnasium and the cafeteria ledge there. And they'll uh, have some stuff to sell for you. If you want a little snack for the ride home, make sure you go after the service and stop by and buy some stuff and and support our um, school seniors for their trip that'll be august 28th um, and then also we're going to be um, having our anniversary sunday the 45th anniversary sunday september 15th and it's going to be a fifth sunday format and uh, we, we, we decided we only get to do this one time where we well at least we know of one time to pay off the mortgage and so we're going to make it a, a big deal and so we'll have some other things to share with you. But um, we're going to be, the church is going to be providing the meat. And so we're going to need some folks to bring in the sides uh, for that. And so it should be a great day. We'll have a lot of activities and things to do for the children and family, families. And so please help us get the word out about it. Uh, we'll have flyers for you by Sunday to start passing out. And then uh, tell people to come with you. And we'll have just a great day together. Uh, make plans to be with us for our fall revival. That's September 23rd to 26th. And that's Monday through Thursday, every night at 7 p.m. And uh, Dr. John Jenkins will be our speaker. Um, I want to just as a, go ahead and tell you this while it's on my heart. Uh, Miss Twig has taken a turn for the worst. And uh, it's not looking good. Hospice has been called in. Um, so she has taken just a, a quick decline, quick turn. Um, we, we visited her what, a couple of days ago, and she was doing good. She was the typical spunky Mrs. Twig, uh, wanting to go home, but then um, her daughter texted this, this uh, afternoon and this evening and said that hospice has been called in, and she's not sure exactly what's going on. Uh, we want the Lord's will to be done, um, but obviously kind of for our own, own sake, we like having her around. And she's a, a joyful presence to be around. And so just pray with me like the, pr the family's praying for the Lord's will to be done. 
and God knows it's in his hands, and uh, we want his will to be done. And we'll have more to say about the prayer list during the prayer time, but um, that one was on my heart, and so we just wanted to share that with you now. So we'll pray for the offering, and then we'll continue with the service. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this evening. Thank you for all that you've given us here at Cornerstone Baptist Church. Thank you for the school. Lord, thank you for the administrator, the teachers, and all the helpers in, in the school, giving the wisdom and, and the strength to continue ministering unto the children. Lord, just be with the, the children of the school, and if any of them have not accepted you as Lord and Savior, Lord, let this year be the year that they accept you as Lord and Savior. And Lord, we think of our missionaries spread all over the world, Lord. Lord, be with each one of them. Give them um, the protection and uh, guidance and, and wisdom to run their ministry uh, uh, for you, Lord, and that you get all the glory and honor uh, that uh, they are doing uh, for you, Lord. And as you have given us a, a time to give back, Lord, bless the, the tithes and the offerings and Lord, let it go into your work to reach uh, Lawrence and the surrounding area uh, for the gospel. Lord, we thank you and praise you in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you would, let's stand. We'll turn to page number four. Uh, number Page number four, as we stand, how great thou, thou art. And uh, don't forget, Kids Club will be starting in two weeks from tonight. And so we're excited about that. If you have any questions, just ask me. We'll get you a flyer and all that. And we're excited about that. Page number four, how great thou art. <clears throat> we'll sing that first and that last verse there. God. 
Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! Then sings my soul. singing you may be seated amen i love that song it's one of my favorite songs and you guys sang it so well tonight and it is good to see you here tonight if you got your bibles go to proverbs chapter six and lord willing we'll be finishing the proverbs six study and uh, moving on to something else the lord's laid on my heart um, but as you're turning to proverbs chapter six i'm never good about uh, exciting things coming up i'm never good about keeping those details quiet okay so i'm gonna re i'm gonna reward the wednesday night crowd tonight okay I'm going to let you know one thing special we're going to be planning for Anniversary Sunday, all right? And um, so uh, we're talking about not sowing discord, okay? So if I tell you to keep a secret, don't let it leave the auditorium, okay? Um, but one of the things we're going to do, how many of you were here? How many of you were here the day, the awesome day, I was reading through it in the 25 years to the Eye of a Pastor book, Pastor Mitchell wrote, and one of the exciting moments of our church's history that I'm trying to recreate is... Do you remember the day when you used to meet in Lawrence, uh, Lawrence Elementary School? Anybody around during those days? Wow, incredible. Do you remember the day you guys had a parade from the Lawrence Elementary School police escort all the way into our new building? You remember that day? So we're trying to, Lord willing, recreate that day. And we're going to all have, uh, anyone that wants to participate, we're going to have the police give us an escort. Now, I've looked it up. It's no longer Lawrence Elementary. It's like a senior citizen's home now. Um, but just use your imagination. Pretend like you're back in 1981. How many of you would like to go back to 1980s? Anybody like to go back to 1980s? Uh, Chloe, you weren't even alive then. But um, those of you that remember those days, I'm sure you want to go back to those days. We're going to try to do that. I've already put in. You have to have a special event permit to do that. So I've already applied with the city to have that special permit approved. And once they do, they'll give us details about how the parade's going to go. Basically, they'll give us a, a police escort like they would a funeral procession. And we're going to start, I think it's um, where that, you know where that, um, what's the name of that plaza? There's a Spanish plaza with Shopper's World in it. Okay, that, that plaza, we're going to start right there. It has a lot of ample parking space. We'll have the cars lined up and the police will lead us out. And we're going to go down Pillington Pike. And the plan is on the bus to have like banners on the side of the bus saying follow us to anniversary sunday at cornerstone it'll be neat and so pray with me pray with me that the permit gets approved because if it's not then we can't do it legally um so i pray that it gets approved now be a, a cool little thing to add to the add to the special day and so pray that it gets approved and that's all i'm going to share with you. that's all you get tonight okay and so uh, aren't you glad you came to church tonight now you know what we're trying to plan all right um but It'll be a good day, okay? If you got your Bibles, go to Proverbs chapter 6 and look at it with me in, uh, in one place. Verse number 19 to start with, and we'll use our Bibles later. It says this in Proverbs chapter 6, 19, it says, A false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Our final stop in our study of things that God hates is uh, the Lord vividly describes discord as being something that displeases him that dishonors him that he's not uh, happy with and uh, and we gave you several reasons last week why and, and one of the main reasons was because uh, discord is the exact opposite of what Christ envisioned and wanted his church to be discord represents division and fighting and uh, backbiting and murmuring those are all things that are complete opposite of what Jesus Christ wants his church to be unified harmonious and to picture that God gives us the illustration of a body different members one body don't lose sight of that and so we're going to pick up this week with identifying someone who is a sower of discord and what the Bible says how we should biblically uh, deal with that and approach that situation and so right, right out of the gate let's just give you one of them uh, number one how to identify and handle biblically a sower of discord Number one, a sower of discord is someone who actively opposes 
the work of God with their mouths. And I want you to see something here. I see something in our text here. Let me try to find a verse. Verse 12 of what, of what book? Oh, in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 12. Proverbs, go with me to Proverbs chapter 6, verse 12. Interesting, interesting wording, and I believe every word in the King James Bible was there for a reason, and it's our responsibility to find what it is. In verse 12, it says this, a naughty person, and that's a good description of someone who would purposely try to sow discord, definitely naughty, a wicked person, and who is this naughty or wicked person? A wicked man, notice this phrase, it says, walketh with a forward mouth. Now, we understand mouths can't walk physically. Our mouths don't have, like, feet that come out, and we just start walking on our mouths. So what on earth does the Bible mean by uh, a, a naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a forward mouth? Well, I think this is what it means. That word walketh, it shows action. It shows you're doing something. You're, in, you're active in doing something. And uh, this is someone who actively opposes the work of God by the way that they use their mouth and the words that come out of their mouth. A forward discord sower is one who disobeys the word of God and opposes the work of God when they talk about problems and uh, situations, other people, and they do that without speaking directly to the person that they're openly discussing to other people. And the Bible, the Bible clearly has a way of, of dealing with things. And when we do things the Bible way, it always works out like it should, like it's God intended it to. And when we go outside of that, that's when discord and everything else negative takes place. You know, the Bible gives us a pretty clear way to deal with people and, and the problems that we have with others. What is, what, is, what is the Bible way to deal with, if you have a problem with somebody, if you, if you uh, have an issue with somebody, what's the Bible way to deal with that? Anybody know? What's the first step? Okay, I probably should have had you go one at a time. I couldn't understand you. Okay, is it to go online and post about them? Is it to call up, call up a friend and say, you will not believe what I heard about so-and-so? Is that how the Bible tells us to deal with things biblically? No, the, the Bible says, let me try to find that reference. It, it gives us a breakdown of the steps. And I think I heard the right thing that you were, you were going in the right direction. But um, it's, Brother Sean, you see that verse anywhere? We're going to find it eventually, I think. Oh, here we go. Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18 and verses 15 through 17. Uh, that's, that's, it gives us the way that we're supposed to deal with things. And it says this, in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17, it says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, pause and time out, if thy brother. So this is only going to work if, if people have, both parties have a biblical understanding of what the Bible says. A brother is indicating someone that is a believer. If you try to do this with someone that's lost, they may appreciate it, they may go with it, but hopefully two people in the context of what we're talking about, a church body, brothers and sisters in Christ, okay? Moreover, if, moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault, him his fault, between thee and him alone. So the, the first step is what? Is to going directly to that person in a spirit of humility with the heart of wanting to reconcile the problem for the sanctity of the body, for the unity of the body, okay? That's step one. Go to that person. Well, that's not in my character. That's not in my nature to, to, to do that. Well, it's, it shouldn't be in your character to go around and talk to everyone else about it except the person you need to talk about it. So go to that person directly. If he shall hear thee, that's, that's the best case scenario. He listens, he understands, and they try to reconcile. Uh, if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. What a beautiful picture of handling things the biblical way, doing it right, and that relationship being restored. Gain thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, which happens a lot, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So if you go to that person, and you have the heart of reconciliation be brought between you and them, and it, it, they won't listen to you, they won't uh, try to get things right, then you're supposed to go back, find some other spiritual people that have the same heart 
of bringing reconciliation to the issue and bring one or two more with you that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established the Bible goes on to say this if they won't hear you they won't hear you and the witnesses that you bring with them then the Bible says this and uh, uh, and if he shall neglect to hear them tell it unto the church so then you're going to get the church involved. Go to the pastor, assisted pastor, somebody in leadership of the church, and, and then go back to them and try to speak with them and bring reconciliation. It says this, and he, if, but if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. The Bible says you're supposed to mark them and avoid them. Mark them and avoid them. And it says this. I want, you to, draw, I want to draw your attention to this. Uh, if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto who? The. The as an heathen man and a publican. We're not supposed to uh, address this situation that's supposed to be dealt with one-on-one -on -one and then tell everybody else. He wouldn't listen to me. I try to take witnesses and, hey, everybody, uh, he wouldn't listen to the church. Everybody here, you need to mark this man. The Bible says, let him be unto thee. That problem needs to be contained between you, him, and the Lord, and uh, don't bring other people into it where you're going to disparage him. No, that's supposed to be between you and him and the Lord. And uh, so that's, that's the way the Bible says we're supposed to deal with things, not the way that a lot of people do in their flesh. Uh, post about it, talk about it, uh, tell everyone you know about the situation and, and make it worse than it should be. But the person who's at Sower Discord actively opposes the work of God with their mouths. What, what, what are we supposed to use our mouths for? What are we supposed to use our words for? Praising the Lord, for sure. What else? Spreading the gospel. Edification, edification. We're supposed to be using our words, the things we say, to build up. Let me ask you something. How effectively are we going to build something up, make something better, improve that situation if we're... Uh, saying things about it, listening to other people say bad and negative, disparaging uh, things about other people, and uh, it's, it's just going to sow discord, and discord is destructive, and that's not what we're supposed to be using our mouths for. Uh, the Bible tells us the process to take, and we've already talked about that, but that, that's, that's supposed to be followed step by step, and a lot of times what we do is this, those people that may not want to deal with things, go to that person one-on-one, -on -one, they skip step one and step two, and they just they just defer everything to the church. Now, the church is there definitely to bring reconciliation, but only after both steps have been used and followed. I think the church has to deal with a lot of things that uh, we scripturally shouldn't have to if, if Christians are just following the Bible and doing their part in it too. Ideally, that person is supposed to go to the other person and then get it right, and it never goes any further. But a lot of times we skip step one and two and just take everything to the church, and we need to follow, follow the Bible way of doing things. Anyone who, listen, this is, so, this is so true, anyone who would just walk up to you and I and begin bad-mouthing somebody else, you don't think they would do the same thing to you and I? If someone just walks up to you and just starts talking bad about someone and uh, starts talking negative and critical and then just spewing just hatred, th chances are I shouldn't say anything to that person because if they're that blatant about doing that to me, they're going to be that blatant, blatant to do that to somebody else about me. And so we're supposed to avoid that, let it stop with you. Hey, let's talk about something else. You know, none of that's really edifying. You know, let's pray for that person. Hey, have you talked to that person yourself about it? Have you, have you followed Matthew chapter 18 and just letting it die with us? The worst thing we can do is uh, entertain that type of conversation. Give an ear to that type of conversation. To ask follow-up questions, to get more details about that situation. And so we've got to deal, deal with things a biblical way, and we'll always be better for it. Anyone who would do that, anyone that would sow discord, I mean, be negative and critical, complain and gossip, murmur, backbite, tail bear, that, that, sh that tells me several things. Number one, they either have little to no scriptural understanding. Someone that will do that does not know what the Bible says. They don't have uh, very much scriptural understanding. Because in Proverbs chapter 29, 11, it says plainly, it says, a fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it until 
afterwards. Let me ask you a question. Why would a wise man keep it until afterwards? What do you think that's a reference to? Someone speaks all their mind. Don't raise your hand or point to somebody that you're around, okay? But just, just answer inside your own heart. Do you know someone like that? I mean, a fool uttereth all his mind. Bless God. Have you ever heard somebody define themselves as not having a filter? That's not endearing. That's not a term of endearment. Oh, how cute. You just don't have a filter. That says you, you need to grow up and mature in your faith as a Christian. Because a Christian should have a filter. It's the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, okay? And someone that says that just speaks their mind no matter what. That's not someone that's wise according to Scripture. Because a wise man is someone that keepeth it in till afterward. A wise man is going to hear every aspect. He's going to hear both sides. He's going to pause and ask the Holy Spirit of God to direct his words and his responses. But a fool is just quick to utter all his mind, speak all his mind, and share all his mind. That's someone that the Bible says is not wise. It's not wise to do that. Someone that does do that may not understand what the Bible says about that. And we that are uh, Christians trying to keep the peace and harmony in the church, we need to do our part in sharing what the Bible says about that. I'm telling you what, if you want to put to rest gossip and murmuring and backbiting and discord, just use Scripture. Scripture dispels a lot. You ever been in public, and uh, it just happened, just happened recently, um, uh, in, standing in line or around a different people, and they start talking about perverted things, or they start cursing. And then when you get up to the register, and they try to start a conversation with you, and they ask, hey, right, what do you do for a living? I'm a Baptist pastor. God bless you. Ain't, ain't the Lord good? Amen. All right? I'm telling you what, the best way to end perverted talk, to end critical speaking, negativity, gossip, murmuring, is just direct everything back and, and respond with Scripture. And the Holy Spirit will honor that. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, 29, the Bible says this, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. Miss McNamara said that. The good use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. We're supposed to be saying words that are seasoned with grace. Uh, graceful responses, edifying responses, and not corrupt, critical, negative, tearing down uh, of words and, and communication. Let me give you a couple more references and we'll move on. Uh, Psalms chapter 34, verses 12 through 13. Psalms 34, verses 12 through 13, the Bible says this. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good? Well, that's something that every one of us should want. I mean, a life, to live the life that God wants us to live and live it abundantly, the life he's given us, and loveth many days that he may see good, may live a long, happy, good, blessed life. Keep thy tongue from evil. The prescription is pretty simple. If you want to have a good life and a life that honors and pleases God and reaps the benefit of God in, in, on his life, keep your tongue from evil. Keep your tongue from evil. Uh, and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil. If we have influences in our life that are encouraging us and influencing us towards sowing discord and evil communication, the Bible says depart from evil. Which is worse, having that awkward conversation with the person that's constantly negative and critical, saying, you know, I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to live for the Lord and do what's right, and uh, I, just, I feel like we're not good for each other when we're around each other. Well, that'll be awkward. They, they may get upset. Which one would you rather upset, the, the sower of discord that's bringing you down or the Holy Spirit of God that's grieved inside of you, that's experiencing what you're saying? Well, I think the answer is pretty obvious. You know, Psalm, uh, J James chapter 411, the Bible says, speak no evil one of another brethren he that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law but if thou judge the law thou art not a doer of the law but a judge We're not supposed to be uh, speaking evil of another and to be a judge that we the, the, the principle is this we think that we are an authority like a judge enough that we have the right to talk any way we want to to anybody else. Think about what that's talking about. In a courtroom setting, that judge is the supreme authority and does as he pleases. Everybody has to ask permission to approach him. They can't speak without his approval and following the court procedures. He is an authority in that, in that arena. And so people that 
feel that they can say anything they want to about someone else has a wrong concept of authority. Nobody possesses that kind of authority. None of us are an authority in, our, in any, any realm that we have free course to use the instrument that God gave us for any other purpose than to edify with grace and to build up. Someone that does believe they can say anything they want to about anyone else has a wrong view of authority because God's the highest authority and God's telling you and I to watch what we say. Someone else uh, that does those things, they reveal that they have little to no scriptural understanding or they may know but they don't care to apply the scripture they understand to their lives. People should not feel welcome or comfortable around you to the place where they share gossip, negative critical remarks or discord with you. If they do, it's our responsibility not to welcome it or to encourage it or to take part in it at all. A sower of discord is someone who actively opposes the work of God, not only with their words, but now we're moving into a different realm. A sower of discord is someone who is actively opposing the work of God with their actions. With their actions. Look at it in verse number 13. Look at it with me in verse number 13. He winketh with his eyes. I mean, can you wink with your eye? Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Everyone can wink with their eye. But what does the Bible say next? It says, he speaketh with his feet. How many of you ever hold a conversation with your foot? If you did, I'd feel a little bit concerned about you, all right? Our toes don't speak to us. Well, if, if your toenails are long, they should say, clip my toenails, okay? But not audibly and physically speaking to us. So what, once again, what does the Bible mean by he speaketh with his feet? Well, some people may not be so bold to actually, uh, may not be so bold to say out loud and to show discord verbally but by their actions they spread discord among the brethren before I give you what I think what I, what I think this means about that how do you think with body language mannerisms or expressions people can show without uttering a word with their body language mannerisms and expressions how can someone show and spread discord that way what do you think Stomping their feet, okay. What else? Okay, crossing their arms, okay. Yeah, how else? What is it? Slamming doors, okay, yeah, sure. Anybody else before I read my list here? Anybody else? Okay, well, here's some things I looked at. A sour look of disapproval on their faces. They uh, get up and leave uh, services and, and make sure everyone sees that they're leaving so they can express their disapproval to everyone else. And now listen, there's good reasons to leave. If you're going to throw up, please, please leave, okay? If I see it or smell it, I may follow you too, okay? So please leave the auditorium, uh, emergencies, things you got to take care of, okay? But no reason at all, but they're going to show everybody they're displeased. It's happened before in Florida. I've seen that happen before. Uh, they uh, purposely don't attend services, to show the pastor and everyone else that they're displeased with something going on. They roll their eyes. They purposely don't laugh or express joy in the service. They do not sing during the song service. They refuse to shake hands with uh, other people that they're upset with. They don't even look in the general direction of someone to avoid to make eye contact. They speak, uh, they speak disagreeing with the preacher uh, to their neighbor during the service. That's actually happened. Not to me, but... And in Florida, someone actually spoke out loud while my pastor preached. It was crazy. Um, they speak disagreeing with the preacher to their neighbor during the service. They sit with their arms crossed. Someone said that. Uh, they have a snarl on their face to ex express their dislike. They shake, they shake their heads or use other gestures. I've had that happen in teen church. Talking about abortion to teenagers, a, little, a, a teenage girl like was shaking her head and saying no out loud to what I was saying. That was, it was the craziest thing ever. They won't attend activities as long as the one they dislike is there. They won't go soul winning or anything else to show how they feel towards the one uh, who has wronged them or they don't like or disapprove of. Those are all things that are really, really petty, okay? We as believers should be faithful to church regardless of if someone has perceived to have done you wrong. Has God done anything wrong with you? Let's don't lose sight of who we're supposed to be going to church for. It's the Lord. 
uh, don't lose sight of who we're supposed to be going witnessing for. It's not them, it's the Lord. And so we, we lose sight sometimes of why we do what we do and for whom we do what we do. All of this is done by the dis- discord sower intentionally to disrupt, to distract, and to oppose the one that they disagree with or they don't like. And they serve in doing so, they only serve one purpose, and that's their own purpose. They only serve their own purpose. They're not fulfilling the purpose that God has placed on their life. The number three, a sower of discord is someone who actively opposes the work of God, not only with what they say, not only with what they do, but now we see a sower of discord uh, from our text is is someone who actively opposes the work of God with their recruiting of others with their recruiting of others. I want you to see something interesting. Look at it with me in verse number 13. He winketh with his eyes, he speaketh with his feet, and he teacheth with his fingers. He teacheth with his fingers. And I understand that many of you are expressive when you talk. You, you talk, you're expressive with your, when you talk. And I see some teachers, I walk up and down the, uh, the, the hallway and I kind of peek in sometimes and man, there is teachers up there, they're teaching with their fingers. You know, they're so active and expressive with their hands, all right? It's very interesting how, how active they are in expressing the, the material with, with their hands. And so I think, I think some key words here help us understand what this is in, conge- in conjunction with uh, the sower of discord. Teacheth to me, indicates someone who is a capable communicator. To be a teacher, you have to be a capable communicator, okay? And someone that's a sower of discord is a capable communicator. And I'll give you some biblical examples. Who in the Bible was someone that could connect with people and just you were drawn to them, they had that magnetism, and they were an effective communicator? But they didn't use that in a positive way they did that to destroy their father's kingdom. Who was that? Absalom. When you consider and study Absalom's life, he had a lot of great things, a lot of great attributes. He just decided to use for his own purpose and for evil purposes and to sow discord in his father's kingdom to recruit people to his side. And a sower of discord, I've, I've learned this, a sower of discord will never be satisfied with just expressing their disdain with what they say. They'll never be just content and satisfied with uh, showing their disdain and disapproval and, uh, and, and just anger and animosity towards other people by what, how they look and their mannerisms. They will, they will not be happy until they've won everybody over to thinking like they do, saying like they, they say, and looking the way they look. They want everybody to be miserable like them. And that's, that's someone, a very sad commentary on someone's life who's gotten to that place in their life. Let me read some verses quickly about Absalom. Absalom was a capable communicator, and a sower of discord is, 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 is such a, a capable communicator. You ever think, why on earth could, could church splits happen? Now, some happen for good reasons. I mean, this church was started from a good church split. There was Im- immorality in the church structure, and the church left that because what they were doing and standing for was right. And so that's a good instance for doing things the right way, leaving an immoral situation. But sometimes you ever think, how on earth could that person convince so many people in the church to come over to their side when their side's wrong? You ever thought that before? I mean, how, how could that person beguile and trick so many people into believing their lie and going over to the dark side? Because they're, they're, they're a good communicator. They're a good communicator. Absalom was too. And it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared his chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy, that's important, came to the king for judgment. In that day, who were people that had problems were supposed to go to? The king. He was the one that acted and served as judge. And so what Absalom did was he knew the place that people with problems were going. He stood beside the gate where people with problems were standing, and he tried to come up with controversy to the people with problems in line. Oh, really? You got a problem? Where's my, where's my dad at? He's not around? Man, if I was king, I'd give you the time that you were looking for. Man, what's your problem? You have a problem with the king because he won't give you time? If I was king, I'd give you all, all the time in the world, man. 
oh, your controversy with the king is because he taxed you. If I was king, I would never tax you. And what he did was he never let a controversy go to waste. He came alongside the line with people with problems, and he said, you know what? Skip the line, guys. VIP pass the future king Absalom. And he was a communicator. Look at it. It says this. Then Absalom called to him and said, of what city art thou? What's he doing? He's making small talk. He's making small talk with the people. How's your day going? Where'd you come from? Yeah, I love that city. Bethlehem. Bethlehem. He's making small talk with them. And he said, thy servant is of one of the tribes of Israel. Oh, you're from there too? I'm one of the tribes of Israel too. Oh, we got so much in common. You know what a sower of discord does? They are masterminds to win people over to their side. They're masterminds of identifying common ground to build trust and relationship. They, they spend adequate time with someone to find common ground with them and common interests with them and become friends with them. For what purpose? To win them over and recruit them to their side, opposing the work of God. How in, wor- how in, wor- in the world could Solomon do that? I mean, Absalom do that. He was a great communicator. He just didn't use his God-given abilities for anything productive. It says this. Uh, he said, uh, and Absalom said unto him, see, thy matters are good and right. You've got a good point there. Man, you, you've got a good case there. You know, you are right. Everything you're saying against my own father. Can you imagine a son sitting there and listening to someone talk junk about his own dad And instead of saying, don't talk to my dad that way, don't talk about my dad in front of me like that, instead of that, he says, you're right. You are so right. But there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Man, the king didn't do his job. There's no one around to do this and help you. Absalom said, moreover, oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, And I would do him, what's the next word? Justice. Justice. He said, you know what? If I was the king, if I was the king that would do this, you know what? Everybody would get justice. Justice. You know, look look what the Bible says here. It says this, and if it was so, that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. I want you to notice this next phrase. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. You know what we're supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be supporting each other. Helping each other. Building each other up. That's what Christians do. That's what a, that's what a family does. You know what? This, this sower of discord is, is a master communicator finding common ground, identifying a problem that's not being dealt with, and then making himself the solution. Be fearful of people like that. I'm always leery of teens that are friends, teen friends, that try to put a wedge between that teen and their family. That's, That's a red flag. Any friend that tries to drive a wedge between that kid and his family, that's a red flag. Any church family that tries to drive a wedge between that church member and their pastor should be a red flag. Any church family, church member that tries to drive a wedge and come between that person's relationship with the Lord, that's a red flag. That's a red flag. Some Another part of the family that is so open and, and easy to talk bad about another member of the church and a, and a part of that body that should be a red flag. Don't, don't be recruited to the sower of discord side. Let me give you one more. We'll have to stop this week. A uh, sower of discord is a capable communicator, but he's also a capable manipulator. Their targets are usually people who are indecisive, neutral, and struggle to think for themselves. They manipulate them by identifying their need, accusing the other side of being incapable incapable, and inadequate of meeting that need, and they set themselves up as the answer to that need. You see it in politics all the time. What What are both sides and all sides saying about each other? 
they're accusing everybody else about what they're doing sometimes. Isn't that, isn't that a political ploy? You know, to, oh, I'm under investigation. Just accuse the other party about what you're guilty of and divert the attention off of you to them. You see that all the time. That's, so, that's what uh, um, a sower of discord does. They're a master manipulator. They're an opportunist. Opportunist. They know the right moment when to enact their plan. They take advantage of opportunities to step in and sow their discord. They look for opportunities that grant them the most exposure and the biggest platform. That's why people go to social media. Why? Because that gets them the most exposure and the biggest following and the biggest platform to sow their discord. They listen to conversations of others who may have expressed a concern and then interject themselves into the conversation to exacerbate the issue until it's blown up into something enormous. They intentionally get close to those who have disagreements or a problem with leadership and then agree with them and win them to their side. Be, be careful of people that are trying to manipulate you into a decision or a uh, position on something. Be careful of that. And, and next week we'll talk about how do we scripturally handle someone who's spreading discord. And Okay, we're going to finish this. There's not enough to do next week. We'll just finish it real quick. We already talked about number one, follow the principles and steps in Scripture to bring about resolution. Follow the principles and steps in Scripture to bring about resolution. That's go into that person. If you have an issue, don't let it fester. Don't go to somebody else. Don't win people to your side. Go to that person. Bring witnesses. Take the church. If not, mark them and move on. But number two, be quick to listen to their side and don't communicate in anger. If we're dealing with conflict, Conflict among believers, problems among each other. We need to be quick to listen to their side and don't communicate in anger. James chapter 1 verse 19 says this, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and then slow to wrath. And then thirdly, we see we need to smother the fire. Smother the fire. Let discord stop with you and I. Let, let's go to Proverbs chapter 26. Proverbs chapter 26, we see this. What do I mean by smother the fire as a part of handling discord when it's being sown? Well, Proverbs 26 shows us in verses 20 to 28, it says this, where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. Listen, this is, this is someone who doesn't know a lot about fire talking about fire, okay? I'm not a redneck. I don't start many fires, okay? But I do know this. You need wood to build a fire, okay? Does that blow your mind, Okay. If you run out of wood, what eventually is going to happen to the fire? It's going to die out. That's right. Good. Uh, so where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceaseth. So what does the Bible equate someone who is a tail bearer as being in the example of a fire? The wood. A tail bearer plays into and keeps the fire of discord going. As coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a what kind of man? A contentious man to kindle strife. When you kindle something, okay, um, you, you stir up those coals. What are you doing? You're, you're trying to kindle it. You're trying to spark up the fire, and it may have died down, and you're kindling it to move around those logs and move around those coals, and then to get the fire burned again. Get the fire burned again. That's what a contentious man is. A contentious man is someone that uh, when things are starting to die down and head in the right direction and bring closure and reconciliation, they come into it and they like to stir it up again, build it up again. It says the words of a talebearer are as wounds. They hurt. Our words hurt. Whoever came up with that saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt me, that is not true at all. The Bible says the words of a talebearer are as wounds. They hurt. They go down deep. Words hurt. And they penetrate and they go right down the heart of us and they break people's spirits and they discourage people. And it's, it's nothing positive. And they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Burning lips and a wicked heart are like potsherd covered with silver dross. It's garbage covered and portrayed as good and pleasant and lovely. He that hateth dissembleth with his lips. And layeth up deceit with him, and he, when he speaketh fair, believe him not. For there are seven abominations in his heart. 
king, seven abominations in his heart. We just talked about the, the things that God hates and things are listed out there. Uh, whose hatred is covered by deceit. His wickedness shall be showed before the whole congregation. Who's, whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein, and he that rolleth a stone it will return, return upon him. A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it, and a flattering mouth worketh ruin. Nothing good comes from it. The fourth thing is this. We're supposed to mark and avoid them. Mark and avoid them. That's so extreme. Well, not if you're trying to keep the church harmonious and unified and going forward, focused on the gospel and edifying. It's not extreme. Romans 16, verses 17 through 18, the Bible says this. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Pastor Morton, I've got this person, this influence, this, uh, this uh, somebody in the church that is constantly bringing me down. They're constantly gossiping about somebody else. They're constantly running people through the mud. They're constantly being that way. What am I supposed to do? The Bible says mark them and avoid them. Don't hang around them. Don't spend your time with them. Remove their influence from your life. Pray for them. Don't be rude to them back in return. But that doesn't mean you fellowship with them and you give them your ear and you spend hours talking to them. It means to mark them and then avoid them. It says, and by good words and fair, uh, by their good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. And then, in some cases, it may come down to. Now, it may come down to this, but it may come down if 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 anybody is working against the cause of Christ, if anybody is working. Uh, to divide the church and to be nasty and hateful and they're gossiping and just running people down and, and they've avoided, uh, uh, avoided reconciliation with the first party. They've ignored the, that party with their witnesses. They would not get it right with the church. What, what, are, we, what are we left with? For the, for the sanct, sanctity of the church, for the harmony of the church, it may come down to where they need to be church disciplined. Medieval church discipline, and nobody wants to get that far, and hopefully it won't happen, but I think the Bible is pretty clear that everything we do is for the harmony and unity of the church and for the body, and anything that works against that, I mean, get it right, just get it right, reconcile and, and get it right, and follow what the Bible says about it. I'll tell you what, God hates discord, and rightfully so, because you know what, when people are fighting with each other, the army of God here in Lawrence is sitting still. It's not going forward. Souls aren't getting reached. Uh, they're not getting discipled the way they should. They're not being ministered to and served, uh, served uh, them and their family. Um, the church isn't growing like it should spiritually or numerically. And the, Bible, the Lord hates that because he wants his church to be united as one body, fitly joined together, and advancing for the cause of Christ. Our theme this year is, and so much the more, we're never going to do anything more for the Lord, for the cause of Christ. We're never going to see more souls saved. We're never going to see more lives uh, changed and helped in a positive way if our church body is not unified. It's not joined together, fitly framed together. Is not using our words in an edifying, seasoned in grace for the building up of other people within our church family. I'm not saying that this is a problem. I'm just saying, look, it I, hopefully it never becomes a problem. Hopefully we're a church that is able to identify discord and deal with it the way the Bible says to. And I know, I'm sure we all know people that, you know, in, are inclined to be negative. Try to be a positive influence to them. Like I said, just let it stop with you. If someone starts to go down a negative path, man, do, do your best to bring it back to a positive. If, if they're trying to bring something up inconspicuously about somebody else just avoid it and turn it positive if they're trying to you know disparage someone else and talk bad about them you know what focus on the positive focus on edifying and being what we should be as believers we're going to go ahead and, and uh, pray and we're going to go a few minutes over if that's okay and then we're going to pray for miss twig um 95 years old she's lived a long life but we want the lord's will to be done could be god's will to get her well and that'd be great it could be god's will that he take her home so she's not suffering pray that god's will be done and if you wouldn't mind praying for leah 
Um, she has a very important ultrasound doctor's appointment to see what's going on with the baby this upcoming Thursday. And so if you could pr please pray for that. We want to uh, hear good news about the baby, um, our son growing like he should and things like that. She still feels them, so that's reassuring to us. But just pray for us this Thursday, uh, next Thursday. And then I, while at, I, was, I was at a preacher fellowship Tuesday, one of my preacher friends, Merv McNair, you know him from um, Lighthouse in Lebanon, um, his daughter's daughter has real bad preeclampsia and it doesn't look good. And so they may lose their baby, his granddaughter, uh, her grandchild. So pray for, I, don't, I didn't catch her name, but pray for Merv McNair's daughter who's, whose baby's not doing well and who has preeclampsia. And um, there's so many others on our prayer list. Do we have any other new prayer requests before we pray? Any other new prayer requests to add? Um, pray for Debbie Davis. She had her pain pump put in, but just um, still sore from the surgery. Um, pray for Mrs. Camacho's son, Ricky, recovering from his motorcycle accident. And um, pray for the family of Rita Buchanan. That's Venus, uh, Venus Duffy's uh, niece who passed away. And then pray for my family. Uh, my grandpa did pass away. Uh, my grandpa in North Carolina. And so his funeral is going to be Monday, August 19th. So pray for that. Anything else before we pray? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, thank you so much for reminding me. So Dan Pointer is, is scheduled to have his prostate cancer, uh, can, uh, prostate procedure Monday, August, August 19th. Um, but he's had, he has some complications. Um, he had some, something concerning was found in a sample that they took. And so they're, they're waiting on testing. Was that right, Brian? Okay. So they don't know what the first sample triggered. And so they're doing blood tests to find out what the complication was. And so it may affect his surgery on Monday. And so just pray for Brother Dan um, um, with that. And then do we have any other announcements to make? Yes. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yes, sir. That was Louise. Louise. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Pray for Brother Mike. He's going to be returning to work soon and not 100% yet. And so just pray that he doesn't overdo it, you know, re-injure himself. And so pray for Brother Mike. Anybody else have a prayer request? Oh, okay. Let's go ahead and pray and then we'll, uh, we'll be dismissed tonight. Dear the Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for loving us, being so good to us. And Lord, thank you so much for just blessing us with just a wonderful church family that has a heart for each other and for you, Lord. And I just, as a shepherd here, I want to just make sure that, um, Lord, that we never, never have that problem take place in our congregation, Lord. And I pray that we do things and handle things the, the Bible way. And Lord, we know that your desire for Cornerstone is to go on 45 years more to, or unless you come back before that and to see souls saved and to um, reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ and and to disciple people and to help people, Lord. And the only way that's going to happen is if we do things the way that you tell us to. And we uh, are using our words. We're using the actions that we, we take, take place in our life. And uh, we're, we're doing things and using the gifts and talents and members of our bodies the way that you want us to, Lord. And that's for edification and building up and to spreading the gospel and to helping people, Lord. And I pray that we would, we would get busy doing that. Father, please be with these folks that were mentioned tonight. Please be with Louise and 
uh, her, her thoughts that she's having about taking her life and wanting to go home and uh, feeling depressed and, and just uh, discouraged about losing so many members so close to Lord, I pray you'd be with them. And just please be with Mrs. Fitzsimmons' friend who was in an accident. I pray that you help her on a road recovery and please help her to heal up and help the surgery to go well. Lord, our hearts go out to the Twig family. I pray that you'd be with them and uh, comfort their hearts and give them strength and peace during this time. And Lord, we, we selfishly want Miss Twig to stick around because she's an encouragement and a, a joy to be around, Lord. But we want your will to be done. Lord, she, uh, she wants to be with her husband. She misses him dearly. And Lord, she wants to be with you most of all. And I pray that your will be done. And just whatever you decide, I pray that you give strength and peace and grace for it. And uh, we're trusting that your grace is going to be sufficient in her life and, and in the lives of her children as well. And I pray that you be with um, Brother Mike as he's um, preparing to go back to work. I pray that you be with him and strengthen his arm and help him on the job site to not uh, re-injure it. I pray that you be with those that are sick, that are struggling, that are hurting. Just please be with them. Please be with Brother Dan. We don't know exactly what's going on and exactly what the complications are, but I, I know you do. And um, that test didn't take you by surprise. And we're trusting you just to, to handle it according to your will. And I pray that his surgery would be stay stay on schedule and that he get it over with and begin his road to recovery. And I pray that you be with um, Leah's appointment coming up. I pray that you would just have your hand of protection on my son and, and my wife as well. And just uh, continue to lead and guide during this pregnancy, Lord. And just please be with all of those that uh, need you, Lord. They have needs on their heart and lives. I pray you meet those needs. And in accordance to your will and i pray father that you would be glorified and pleased with everything we do and say this week and help us have a great day in your house on sunday we love you and we're pleased to be with all the other requests that we didn't get to you know exactly what they are and what their needs are and i pray that you would meet every single need on this list and i pray that you would just work in and through their life and we ask all these things in jesus name amen all right thank you so much for being here tonight lord willing we'll see you we'll see you sunday